know, I, I was thinking about this. You know, Josiah's talking about this. Why, why do we think that we are any different than the disciples that were called by Jesus Christ? Why, why do we think that, um, that, that we would not be called out in such a way as Jesus saw people, and as Joe was talking about this, you know, on these pathways, whether it's being a fisherman, or whether it's being a tax collector, whether it's being a zealot, whether it's whatever they were doing, is that as they were on this journey on their own little carpet doing whatever, digging their own trenches, that God put, put your tools down or, or, or come and join me in what I'm calling you to. And that, and yes, I mean, you can't tell me that they wouldn't be feeling some anxiety of what that looks like. Oh my word, what does that mean when I have to come follow Jesus? And that's what we've been called to do, is to come and follow Jesus. To actually put down whatever we think is important to us, and, and you know what's important to you. I know what's important to me. I know what it means if, if Jesus says, come and follow me and go someplace other than here in Lebanon, Oregon. That's going to require something of me. It's going to require some, some action steps. It's, it's requiring some faith steps, some, some sense of saying, do I truly trust God? You know, we prayed about this this morning in our prayer time, about trusting in God, trust in the Lord, who is our everlasting rock. And I love just the image of, of being that solid foundation that we're on, but realizing that even though we're on that foundation, we can still choose to get off of it and do something else. And do our own. As even as Josiah is talking about, we can choose to continue digging, right? A certain direction. So, well, this is just me and Jesus. We're going this direction. We're going forward. I think what's important for us to understand is that God is calling a people. He's calling a church. He's calling his body. And sometimes we get very individualistic when it comes to the call of God in our lives. We think, well, how, do, you know, how does that affect me? Well, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that. I, you know, as a pastor, I have people come up to me, and maybe some of you have done this, and I apologize, and I'm not speaking directly to you, but I guess I kind of am. Um, in, in that people will come up to me, and, and, and they'll say, hey, I, I believe that I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to move from here and go over here. And they'll say, I believe God has told me that I'm supposed to do it. And that's how the conversation begins. Now, in that conversation, it's difficult to, to partner with because it's like you've already decided God's already spoken to you individually. And I said, well, okay, maybe that's true. But God hasn't spoken to me at all about, about you leaving. Now, as a, as a body of believers, we actually allow the grace gifts in one another to actually be infecting our lives, to be saying, hey, I welcome that into my life. And, and so it's important that even as we're in community and we're deciding to make decisions, I, I'd encourage you to pick up a phone call, call a pastor, call someone that you have spiritual authority in your life to say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this God? Is this not God? Because sometimes when someone says that to, to me, I want to say, that's not God. Now, I wouldn't say it unless I really felt that wasn't God. And I don't do, do that very often. But sometimes I, I just haven't heard. I haven't had a chance to even say, well, is that God? You know, God, are you really telling this person to do that? I think that's what's so important. We realize that God is calling us in community. Yes, maybe it is going over here and going over there. Or maybe it is simply crossing the street. Or maybe it is just having a conversation with someone that's irreligious. Or someone that, that maybe at one time you were in odds against, but now you realize, hey, I'm supposed to restore this relationship. And God's calling me to, to, to make a disciple, to step out into the nations, into the community. And I say, but what, what's going through my mind? Is it truly something that as a community of believers and my trust in the Lord is going to put people in my lives to help me as I'm stepping out to say, hey, I want to step out together. I think that's the challenge we face in the Americanized culture. You know, one thing, I'm, I'm having a rabbit trail here. One thing I think is awesome that I'm seeing within our culture is, is we're seeing more and more American families actually inviting other family members to come and live with them. Instead of saying, hey, I'm shipping you off to a retirement home or shipping you off to this. Or ship, is that you're actually saying, hey, if we, can, if we could do this, let's come together. And there's something about that because what happens is it comes against our American mindset. The man, oh, I need to be free from any other relationship so I can just do what I want to do. And so retirement is, is freedom from everybody. And so just me and my spouse or if I'm single, I can just travel the world and do whatever I want to do. I don't have any strings attached. That's the American dream. Is that I have the resources now just to do whatever I want to do. 
But when I read the Bible, I don't see ever a disconnect from the rest of the body of Christ. I don't see anything in it that says, okay, hands, slice yourself off. You're getting a little bit old. You've done enough work. Now, Because what happens if I was to cut my hand off, it would die. It wouldn't survive that surgery. And we realize that we're not called to be separated, but we're called to come together in community. I, that's where we see the Bible and we, we see what God's called us to be on mission together is to go into all the world and making disciples that we as a people are called to go. And what's cool is when it's a people, then what happens is you, you don't sound so crazy, right? Because if I know someone's going to jump off the bridge, this is when I was younger, jumping off a bridge, doing that in community was way better than doing it by myself. Because in community, we would actually encourage each other, and eventually we'd be stupid enough that we'd start jumping. And one would jump, another. I'm not saying that's the best thing, okay? But nevertheless, what happened is that in community, there became boldness and courage and, and, and excitement to say, hey, let's do this thing. That we don't do it by ourselves. And I think whatever we're doing, you know, I think about just within community, is like do it with other people. Do, do, it, with, do it with your friends. You know, one of our, as Christ Central Churches, it's, it's really being friends on mission. Is that we're just friends on mission. We're, we're just friends that are connecting together, and we're just doing life, whatever that looks like. And there's something about doing it with your friends that's super important. And it's super helpful as we're walking this thing out. You're not just doing it as a maverick all by yourself. I mean, that's that, that word for us as a church is really God speaking to us together to go and make disciples of all nations. And what does that look like? What does that look like as being part of that? And really saying we all have a part to play. And I was challenged just thinking about in my devotions not too long ago, I was writing down that we're not, because sometimes you, as an American church, you can see yourself and other nations can see you as a resource. Oh, you have, you know, the wealth of America, the resource for this and the resource for that. But I think God's calling us to not be, I mean, not that we're not a resource to some degree, but that we're called to reproduce. That we're called to, 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 to take what God has birthed in us and reproduce it in other nations, cultures, cities, whatever it might be. And I think the challenge for us is to say, are we willing as a people to say to join together on mission? Instead of having our own little mission, is that we're really to join together and say, what is God saying to us? What is God calling us to do as a people? And that means everyone has a part to play in what God's calling us to. I think it's good that Josiah mentioned, not just, because we can talk about church planning, which is the number one most effective way to evangelize a community is to plant a local church. It, it just is, statistically. It's like that church grows with non-believers. It doesn't grow with church plant. I mean, other, you know, transfer people from one. No, those guys are all looking going, what in the world is going on over there? But people in the community are going, man, I want to be connected to something new, something exciting God's doing. And so you, you realize that, that together as we're, as we're processing through this, and even as you're thinking through, it's not just church planting as much as it is on mission. That we're reproducing, that we're doing what God's called us to do, whatever that looks like in our community, in the communities around us. I know this week, I sat down with Lynn, I invited Lynn, I sat down with the mayor, I sat down with uh, the city attorney, I sat down with another one of the staff members here in our building, and we just started talking about the homeless challenge. I remember I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and so we're walking, I felt like when I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, that was you affirming that I just moved forward with this. All right, I, I kind of say things, and when I'm, once I say it out loud, it's like you saying yes to me. Because no one stood up and said, don't you dare do that, right? And so if you want me not to do something, that's what you have to do. You got to stand up and shout me down, all right? But anyway, so, so I have this, have this meeting, and, and we were talking, and, and we're going to talk this week with the eldership team, or actually next week with the eldership team. But just one thing that I just found in that conversation is just I felt the presence of God. I, I, I felt... I mean, even Lynn and I, we looked at each other when, when they left. We're going, isn't it cool to be invited into this conversation? We're the church. 
we're Christians. We're, we, we, are, we are biblically founded in, in, in our truth and our worldview. And we've been invited to be part of a solution. Be part of a need within our community. And I just, it's just like, I just love the sense of God being in the midst of things like that. And, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But I'm just saying in those moments, I think as we're stepping out. Like I said, not just going to other cities, but in our own city. Is that God's going to challenge us as individuals. Is how are we going to meet that need? I know Mike and I were talking the other day, texting back and forth, and how we need, we need to bring some people together and begin to intentionally think, what does this look like? And so that'll be our next thing, is to bring some folks together and say, hey, let's collectively start processing through how can we best meet these needs? And here's what's being asked of us. There are things that are being asked of us. Are we willing to say yes to the ask? Or do we look at it and go, that's odd, that's not, that's different, that's challenging us. Whatever. Or do we say, hey, wait a minute, we're not doing this isolated with just one individual. We're doing this as a body of believers. Or being sense of what that looks like. And it could be challenging for some of us. But to be able to say, Lord, I'm going to put aside my own perspective, my own ideology of what I think church should look like and, and how we do this and do that and say, Lord God, if you're doing something here, I want to be faithful to say yes to you. And, and I think that's how, that that's really is just a disciple mentality. A disciple mentality is this, if Jesus walks up and says, hey, come follow me, then we follow him. It, it's not that sense, a, a, a disciple mentality is one, not that, that quickly starts laying out all these excuses of why we shouldn't, couldn't, I can't, they could, maybe, but we actually just say, yes, Lord, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you. And I think that's the challenge we have within the American culture is to get away from the individualistic visions that we might have and say, Lord, what are we doing together on mission? Because we could truly do more together than we can apart. And we believe that as Christ Central Churches, that we truly believe that we could do more together than we can apart. I know we're in the UK as we're spending time with people, and, and Josiah and I are actually going to go to Mexico in the end of August and spend time with churches in Mexico and talk about the very things that God's speaking to all of us as far as churches in, the, in Canada, in America, in, in Central America, in Mexico, and say, how are we doing this together? What does this look like as we're casting vision for going to all the world, for making disciples in our communities and the communities around us? What does that look like? Let, let, let's, let's knock off the paradigm and let's do something new. I know Lynn was talking the other day about we are a church plant. This church is a church plant. All right, we've planted churches. We actually tried to plant a church in Emory, Texas. That was awesome. We actually had some people in our church that were part of that church plant even to this day. And then we planted a church in Graham, Washington, which our kids are going to go up there and spend time with those kids up in Washington together. Is that, is that, it's not it's something that we've never done before. But that God's doing something new in that he's saying, hey, it may not be the way you think. It may be different than you think. It's yes, but different than it looks like before. And I think being open to saying, God, what are you doing and how are you doing this within our community as well as the communities around us? And that's the, that, that's the excitement about being Christ followers is that someday he's going to tell you, like we heard this morning in prayer about Get out of the boat. The Jesus, you look, keep your eyes on Jesus, and guess what? You step out onto water. I mean, just think about that for a second. You're in a, a boat that's afloat, and next thing you do, you're going to go out onto the water. Why? Why do we do anything? Why do you come to church on a Sunday morning when you could be at the lake? You could be camping. You could be something else. Instead, you've chosen to come together in community and say, God, you want to do something with us together. We want to gather. Whenever we open the door, we want to come together and hear what you're doing with all of us. There's something about Jesus that draws us together. There's something that Jesus makes you put aside something and say, I want to follow him. There's something about Jesus. All of a sudden, my issues pale in comparison to the other challenges that others are facing. We say, how can we reach out and love people as Christ loved people. And he changes our, our motivations, changes our heart, and we just start doing things differently. I think that's the key to anything that God's calling us to, is that we want to keep our eye on Jesus, on what Christ is doing in our lives. All right, there's your introduction. Uh, I can tell you right now, we're not getting through this bad boy. Um, 
But, but it's awesome just realize that in this passive scripture that we're going to read here this morning, as, as, we, as we read already in Ephesians chapter 4, we began to see in the verse, first few verses about how he's connecting us through characteristics of Jesus Christ, characters of humility, of gentleness, characteristics that have to do with patience, have to do with enduring with one another in love. And saying, and we're realizing that those aren't the easiest characteristics, especially for guys. To actually go, oh, I gotta be humble, I gotta be gentle, right? And we talk through all those things. And yet these are things that the Bible talks about that unite us in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all those things unite us together. It's characteristics that Jesus exemplified as he walked among us. We say, hey, we too can walk as he has walked. And we realize that, that all as Paul is saying to us is that as you put on these characteristics, it's going to bring unity. Because guess what? As Paul keeps going on here, and he starts talking about the church, talking about what we're called to do, man, without these characteristics, there's going to be bitter, backbiting, gossip. I mean, easily, when you get close to one another, what happens? Right? When you get to know each other a little too well. You start knowing the garbage. You start knowing the stuff that's been in our closet or stuff that we've dealt with, that we've dealt with, but now it's new to you. Oh, I learned that about you. Oh, I didn't know that about you before. Now all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you don't smell as good as you. Right, because all of a sudden we, we, we attribute certain things, even though it's already been nailed to the cross and dealt with by the blood of Jesus, we still as individuals somehow hold on to things. That think, oh, and that is in our nature. It's all to say, hey, well, oh, that. Okay, I never did that, so, okay, yeah, okay, there, or, you know, we measure ourselves against one another, which is not what Christ would want us to do. He wants us to walk in unity with one another, to come together in community. I know we were talking this on Thursday, I, I've been going to the men's, the men's, sorry, I've been going to the, um, the prayer meeting that the churches gather together on Thursday morning, and we started just talking about the church, how putting aside the differences and putting aside, and it's amazing, as, as you're as you're talking about it, how it, 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 it just stirs some excitement in the room. That there's something about the church in Lebanon not having division that excites people. But then we quickly, well, we've got enough division in our own church. How can we spend time trying to break down these walls? And then all of a sudden the barriers come up, the walls, and the next thing you're like, oh, that's a good thought, hallelujah, we should pray about that. And we kind of go on our way. But, but, but yet the thought of that, the thought of, of the church, and, and I can't help but think about heaven. I don't think heaven's going to be split up in denominations. I, I don't know about you. I, I don't. I don't think it's going to be the charismatic, the reformed, the, the, the Baptist, the, the Lutheran. I mean, I don't think you're going to see this big division of, of the churches. We're all like, you know, hey, you know, you know, those whole things when, when we shout across the room with one another. I can't remember that saying. We used to yell with one another. But we're in sporting facilities and we're shouting across. And they're shouting louder. Then you shout louder. And we're, you know, shouting against each other. I don't think that's going to happen in heaven. I, I, I don't think there's going to be this sense of, of division. And I don't think it has to happen today. It does because we're a bunch of fleshly suckers. Right? We are. We, we, we just are. We just have certain things that we believe about certain things. And so there, there's challenges within that, us interpreting and trying to figure that stuff out. And so for whatever reason, you have the separation. But we should rejoice that there are people that are connecting, even though there's separation at times on a Sunday morning, that we're still connected together. And I love that as I've been going more regularly on that Thursday morning, I just feel God just challenging me to, to be more connected in what's happening and just the sense of, of community even if it's on that Thursday morning and once or a couple times a year, I think it's something that we as a church need to buy into. I would challenge us, when we have a community service, that you show up. It's not, it's not a day off. It's not, a, it's not, well, okay, well, the church is coming together. It's like you more than anything need to be there. We need to be there together in community. Once again, it's coming together and saying, man, Jesus Christ is doing something in the city of Lebanon. The churches are gathering together. That means I am gathering together. I'm coming together as one body of believers. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen a couple times throughout the year. 
So unity is an important part of what we're called to. I don't know, where am I on these clicker things? All right, so let's see if I have anything to say. All right, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. Oh yeah, because the whole thought of in, in Genesis and then also in Revelation, you have back and forth, you have in the beginning, there's this desire for unity. So in, in turn in Revelation, you see once again coming together. It's, it's, not, it's not just a message within the Bible. It's about he unites us together. It was once broken, and through Jesus Christ unites us together. The church is to be united together. And, and if we're going to walk through this passage of Scripture together over the next number of weeks or, well, the rate I'm going, the next number of years, um, but whatever. But, but as we're walking through this together, it's like there, there's a sense of knowing God is speaking to us for a reason. Why well, we need to understand this in our innermost being, because the devil's going to come in, our flesh is going to rise up, something's going to happen, and you're going to get ticked off. You're going to get upset at somebody. And when that moment happens, it's really is that, is that come to Jesus moment to say, is it really about me? Is, is this issue I have, is, is, is this, is this the, the deal breaker? Why do we live with deal breakers? Well, why do we have those sense in our minds, well, if this happens, I'm out of here. We do that in relationships. We do that in, in jobs. It's as we're walking through life, and, and in our own mind, we haven't articulated it, but we're thinking it. If he does this one more time, <laughs> man, I thank God for my wife because she doesn't have a deal breaker mentality. She, she doesn't live with that sense if he does this one more time. Now, she might say it sometimes, but, but, but I know that, but I know, but I know in her heart, I, I, I trust her love for me that even though I've done it again, it's not this deal breaker moment in our marriage. It's like we don't live with that kind of anxiety. There's enough anxiety around us to, to create anxiety. And we do that. We, man. Oh, man. I mean, for some reason, we, we feed off a of drama. It's like, can I stir up? Can I, can I challenge? Can, can I think, they, oh, did they mean this? Or are they thinking this? Or Instead of just coming to the person asking, point blank, hey, did you mean this? No, I didn't mean that. Okay, well, I'm glad I asked you because I thought you did. That we don't allow those things to come in and bring division. I love this passage in, in Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. I, I love that. That's Revelation. That, that's, what, that's what isn't just what's to come. It's what is. As we look at Scripture, we read even this passage of Scripture here, is that we realize that, that God has called us to be in unity with one another. The fall created separation. And I thought about bringing a whiteboard up here, but I got so much to do today, I thought there's no way. But, but if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw these two circles. And it starts like this, one over the top of the other. It's heaven and earth. When we see creation, you have heaven, heaven and earth connected together like this. Then the fall came and it separated us. And then Jesus came, and then you see the, the, the circles start coming together. And you see the sense, you know how they cross over, and they're united. You see, that's, that's what's happened. The cross reunites heaven and earth. And what you have is when people are getting saved all around the globe, you see these pockets of all of a sudden heaven and earth popping up all over the place. Because now we're heaven-minded. We understand that we don't think about the things of this earth. Now we set our mind on things above. It talks about in Colossians chapter, chapter 3. Is that we get excited about realizing that, hey, God, what, 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 was, what was desired in the very beginning, we actually see it, an example of that through the cross. And then to realize someday there's going to be what? A new heaven and new earth. And once again, once again, we're back to where we started. And, and, and the excitement about that is saying, hey, that, this story, this whole story from Genesis to Revelation is about the story of coming together, the brokenness, but then the, the, the restoration of God's people back to himself. And then to live in eternity with him. It's exciting just to think about that. But in, in this passage of scripture earlier we talked about, um, and this isn't on the overhead, but Ephesians 2 verse 14, the emphasis of, of coming together. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in 
the place of the two. And the man here is represented to mankind, all right? So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. For through him, through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Realizing that sense of the, the Gentiles and the Jews, because of Christ Jesus, the mystery of it became very clear that he's uniting us together. He came as the ultimate unifier. And that's what this passage of scripture is really talking about. And I'm just watching the clock and man, oh man. I'm weighing out whether I, let, let, let me just share one. Let me, just, let me at least just read the, the passage, all right? So here it is. Let's at least read this out loud. We'll talk about this more next week. But here is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. I mean, just, just reading that passage of scripture, it's so important that this doctrine of unification, what Christ has done in bringing us together, is so important as you begin to walk this thing out. Because I think even the prophetic word and the, those, those pictures, that, that it makes sense to us, right? Why? Because we find ourselves doing all these other things. The, the, these, the, the sense of going different directions. Instead of coming together as one people and say, God, what are you speaking to us? Lord, what, what, what is our Heavenly Father? What is our, our, our hope? What is our faith? What is our, our sense of understanding that he is calling us to be unified as one? Under Christ Jesus. Which means. Dying to ourselves. I mean the gospel is talking about. Lay our life down. Pick up our cross daily. And follow him. Are we willing to do that? Are we really willing to. To do what Christ has done. And. That he says. Hey not my will. But yours be done. Is our prayer. Not my will Lord. But yours be done. Or is it Lord. Let your will line up with my will. This is what I want to do, Lord. I hope you, I hope you bless it. I hope you, I hope you shine down on me and bless this endeavor. Because here's what I want to do. And I know, and I know we, we don't have those kind of conversations. I know that. I know you're not telling God, oh, God, you know, I mean. But yet oftentimes our actions speak much clearer than our words. You know, this morning we're going we're gonna to do a water baptism. And Kim, you can come up here now. And I think... I'll talk about this some more next week, but I want to say this this morning because I think when I think about things that unite us, then there probably isn't a clear, more beautiful picture or illustration of that than there is in water baptism. Because this is in Romans chapter 6, it talks about when we died with Christ Jesus in his death, as he died, so we died, as he rose, we also rose. Is that, is that connecting with, with what Jesus Christ did on the cross? When he dealt with sin, our death is, is a burial of sin. It says, hey, th this represents, we, we really get it. We understand that in our going under, as it were, dying to ourself. Right? We're, we're dying to ourself. We're saying, it's no longer about me. It's no longer about my desires, my, my sinful nature, my own wants. That stuff is going to stay in this tub. It's not coming out of me. And then what, then what we pray is that because we, we, we believe that there's one baptism, there's two expressions of it. There's water baptism, and there's also baptism in fire. As we believe that there's a Holy Spirit empowering that comes upon a person as they come out of the waters of baptism, as we're laying hands on them, we're praying the Holy Spirit to empower them as they come out of the waters to do what God's called them to be, to be bold and courageous and a witness to go into all the world, into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's our heart and our desire to see these people released in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in my Bible, and probably in yours, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. You know, one thing, I, and this is my own little personal, I, I, I believe, I, I believe that, that when Jesus was baptized, he's baptized in water, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
I, I believe the church was trying to figure it all out as they were going for us. Some were getting baptized in water. Then they're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or they're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then they're getting baptized in water or whatever it was. But we can see, we have the scriptures, we read it and see how Jesus was baptized in water and he was baptized in the Holy Spirit at the same time. And so when I read this passage about one baptism, I don't go, well, that just means water baptism or that just means baptism in the Holy Spirit. I said, no, I think there's one baptism with two expressions of that baptism. I think we're baptized in water because what it represents is dying to ourselves, baptized in the Holy Spirit, because that represents a brand new life full of the Holy Spirit to do what God's calling us to do. And it's and a simultaneous is both necessary as we live our lives in Christ Jesus, as it unites us with Jesus. This is a uniting ceremony, right? It's a uniting opportunity for us as witnesses of people that says, hey, I'm uniting myself with Jesus Christ. It's no longer about Vlad. It's no longer about May. It's no longer about Ashley. It's now about them uniting themselves with Christ. They're them saying, hey, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm all in. Literally, they're going to be in about a minute. You know, they're all in. We're getting dunked in this, t- in this tub. And it represents something fantastic. As Christ died, we died. As Christ rose, we too rise from these waters, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do amazing, to do amazing things. Thanks for watching this YouTube video. Hope we've already done this, but if not, hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell. We'd love to stay connected with you. This is a great way for out and about to make sure you remain part of what we're doing here at the River Center. There'll be another great video next week. So check it out and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks.